Hey, what's up, y'all? This is Bo Beach with Free Speech with Bo Beach, the podcast. To Because the podcast is new, I want to go over with you very quickly what this podcast is all about. We are going to discuss Nashville, commercial real estate, trigger warning, politics, culture, and sports. The idea is this is going to be a casual conversation. It's going to be unfiltered. It is going to be as if we're buddies and just discussing these topics in a very casual, easy to understand way where we're not really filtering the information and trying to present it in a real professional way, which is why I'm dressed the way I'm dressed. I'm not suited up like I normally am. This podcast is intended to be more casual in nature. So let's get into it. I'm going to give you kind of an overview of what we're going to discuss on today's podcast. First, we're going to talk about a very high profile hotel deal that just went down in Nashville and what that means for the strength of our hotel market. We're going to talk about the office vacancy rate nationally and how that compares to what we're experiencing today in Nashville. We're going to talk about a real lack of small industrial properties in Nashville and how Our shortage of small industrial properties really stacks up against the rest of the country, to put that in perspective for you. We're going to talk about the strength of the short-term rental market in Nashville and how that stacks up nationally. Then as we move on to the politics section of the show, we're going to talk about all of the uh, you know, hysteria and attention around Jews in the United States. We're going to put in perspective really how many Jews there actually are and what's actually going on there. That's always been a head scratcher for me, the amount of attention the Jews get. We're going to talk about the foolishness of identity politics, right, which is going to be fun. We're going to talk about the money that our government, our federal government is wasting in Ukraine and put that in perspective for you all. Then we're going to move back to more real estate related topics. We're going to talk about the interest rate cuts that were forecast for 2024 and how they're being revised now and what we can expect going forward. We're going to talk about how Nashville is one of the most desirable markets for uh, the major developers, both in the United States and Canada. And I've got a case study to work through uh, with you there. We're going to talk about one of the most successful office developers and investors in the area. Uh, and how they've really narrowed down the markets they're interested in working in and how Nashville is one of those markets and really what they've done to outperform the office market. We're going to talk about celebrity branded bars on Broadway, how that works. You know, a lot of people think the celebrities actually own those bars. That's not the truth. And we're also going to talk about how one of those celebrity branded bars is getting rebranded to a new celebrity. Lastly, we're going to finish up with a little bit of an update on where we are in the NBA playoffs, because I know many folks don't tune into the NBA playoffs until much late, much later in the process. So that's what we're going to cover in today's show. Uh, If those are topics of interest to you, please continue to listen and let's get started. Number one, host hotels and resorts recently completed the acquisition of the 215 room one hotel nashville and the 506 room embassy suites in downtown nashville these are kind of sister properties that were developed side by side this transaction 530 million dollars cash money the buyer already owns the 255 room hyatt place downtown They claim to be just getting started in the market, right? So they already own three of the most high profile hotels downtown. They claim to be just getting started because they, in their words, call Nashville the quote, market of the future, unquote. And really what's driving that, right? You know, we're seeing these eye popping prices being paid for hotel rooms in downtown Nashville. What is driving that, right? Well, what we have to consider is in the hotel business, most of the money uh, on average is made on the weekends, right? Thursday through Sunday, right? 
if you really want to outperform financially with a, excuse me, hot in here today. If you really want to outperform financially, you know, you've really got to make money Monday through Thursday as well, right? And in many markets, downtown city centers are ghost towns Monday through Thursday. Hotels are just sitting unused. That's not true in Nashville. You know, we've got sporting events that bring people to town, but really what's driving the uh, outperformance financially in Nashville is our convention market, right? We are the number two convention market in the country behind only Orlando. So when we have these huge conventions at the convention center downtown, all of those hotels fill up. And that's really kind of, you know, when you're making money Monday through Thursday, those that, that revenue really flows right through to the bottom line, right? Because you really have got pretty fixed expenses at that point, and you're just putting those additional rooms to work. So that room revenue goes straight to the bottom line, which makes these hotels really outperform. So if, if you're wondering how it's possible for sophisticated buyers to be purchasing hotels in downtown Nashville at the prices they are, they're doing so because they're so financially successful Monday through Thursday that it makes sense to, right? Now, host hotels and resorts stated three reasons that are making them increasingly bullish on Nashville properties. One being the airport expansion, right? We're trying to expand our airport. We're trying to get more nonstop flights from places farther away to make us even more of a tourist destination. Obviously, we've got Amazon that's in town and growing. <clears throat> and of course, we covered it at length in last week's show. Oracle's world headquarters will soon be headquartered here in Nashville. So we've got all of these positive things happening in Nashville. It's really propping up our hotel business, which is making those hotels very, very valuable. And once you've got the biggest and the baddest investors coming into your market, paying real premiums, to get their hands on these properties, you know that you've got something special in Nashville. Absolutely has something special in its downtown hotel market right now. Next, let's move on to a discussion about the office vacancy market in this country, right? Right now, across the country, there is a 20% national office vacancy rate, which is a absolute record high, the highest of all time, right? So, in a lot of markets, they're feeling a lot of pain. You know, the markets that are feeling the most pain are in those blue states, it, rather in blue cities and blue states, right? So those are the ones that got hurt the most. We've got New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Boston. Those markets are really getting killed. And a lot of those downtowns have been hollowed out and people are just unwilling to go back to those city centers unless they're forced to. So what are tenants, office tenants, really looking for as their leases roll over and they have to make a decision about their future? Well, number one, they're looking for shorter commutes, right? Their people, if they do have to come to the office, want to have a very short commute, right? The business itself is looking to reduce costs, right? So if you move out of the city center, you're going to reduce costs uh, just by making that decision. But if you move out of the city center to a more suburban location and you downsize your footprint, now you've really reduced costs. You can perhaps get your office uh, lease cost down 50%, right? And, you know, to put in perspective for you, behind the cost of their people, right? Their employees, uh, the cost of their office space, the cost of their real estate is usually one of the next highest line items on a business's profit and loss statement. So reducing your real estate costs by 50% makes a material difference to that business's bottom line. When everything else is going up in price because of the inflation that the current federal government has caused with their insane government spending and bad decision making, you know, you've got businesses looking to save money elsewhere. And there's really not a whole lot of ways to save money in today's marketplace besides laying off people and reducing your office space, which is what we're seeing. Those tenants also want flexibility, right? And this is the part that is, makes it very, very difficult for office landlords. 
right? Because the challenge with the office leasing market is most of those leases require the landlord to make a big upfront investment at the front of that lease in both tenant improvements and lease commissions paid, right? So if you're if you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars to finish out a suite for a tenant per their unique needs, which is the norm, right? You know, as a landlord, you're thinking, okay, if I get a five or a seven or a 10 year lease, I can make that money back a little bit at a time over time. And, and it makes sense to me, right? The, the, the lease payment for the tenant is low enough that it makes sense for them because I can spread those upfront improvements out over the life of the lease. And it makes sense for me because I get that upfront investment recouped over the life of the lease. The problem is tenants now want shorter leases, right? So all of those deals that made sense for the landlord with a seven year lease, if you take that same tenant, that same build out, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't pencil on a three year lease because there's not enough time to recoup those upfront investments. And to do so, we would have to increase the rent to a level that becomes unattractive to the tenant. So you've got this scenario where you've got tenants wanting these short, flexible leases but also requiring improvements on the front end and the deal doesn't pencil for the landlord and the deal doesn't pencil for the tenant. So we've kind of got this stalemate, right? So you've got a lot of issues going on in the national office vacancy market, some self-inflicted by the bad decisions that they've made locally about their local governance. Those markets are going to be very, very difficult to come back from. But in Nashville where, you know, the, the self-governance is uh, not perfect, but certainly better than most large cities around the country. Uh, we aren't experienced nearly as much of the disruption to the office building market. That said, as these leases are turning over, these tenants are still thinking the same thing. Hey, we need to move out of the city center, parking issues in the city center, high costs of business in the city center, even in Nashville, we've got homeless people problem in the city center, which is shocking to me that we can't sort that out in a reasonable way. You know, so we still feel a little bit of this transition in Nashville, but we're nowhere near that 20% office vacancy rate. And we've got a lot of class, class A space coming out of the ground. So Nashville has a lot more going for it than these other large markets do. We've been very, very insulated from the pain that's being felt in these other comparable markets. And I don't see that changing anytime soon because we're one of the top four markets in this country, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Now, one thing that you may not realize is we have an extreme shortage of small industrial properties in Nashville, right? To the extent we're the sixth worst for available small industrial property in the country. Right. So that's a list that you don't necessarily want to be on. Right. Where you've got a huge shortage relative to demand. Well, we're six worse in the country for uh, a balance of supply and demand in the small industrial space. Right. And this is a business segment of the business. I work in a lot. Right. I sell a lot of small industrial property. I'm very aware that there's a shortage of it in the marketplace. I'm very aware that it's very hard to reproduce today. The the cost of land the lack of industrial zone land, the difficulty developing today and the cost of development, all of which is leading to uh, not a whole lot of new supply coming online. And the industrial properties that are get coming out of the ground are these massive properties because it makes more sense financially for the developer to build, you know, one 300,000 square foot facility than it, it, it makes uh, it makes more sense to do that than it makes sense to make one big property with 103,000 square foot spaces, right? It just doesn't pencil out for the developer as much. So the, 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 the thing to take away here, the takeaway is we have a real shortage of small industrial properties in the Nashville area, and that's not going to change anytime soon. So if you've got one that you really like, it would be in your best interest to lock that up as long as you possibly can. If, if that means you want to remain a tenant, extend that lease and no, negotiate some options. Uh, if you are a tenant that would prefer to own, I would recommend reaching out to your landlord and starting that conversation. Perhaps you could become the owner 
of that property uh, because this is going to be a challenge that we have to deal with for the foreseeable future, a real lack of supply of small industrial space in Metro Nashville. It is here to stay. All right, let's keep moving. Let's move on to the politics section of today's show, which I, I think is very fun. It's We live in a, uh, a society where it's kind of dangerous to be honest about your political opinions, but you know, someone's got to do it. If, if, if we aren't brave enough to really just stand up and be honest about what we believe and what we think is right and what we think is wrong, we're going to continue down uh, the toilet bowl like we are right now. I will tell you that in my 42 years of life, I don't think there's ever been a lower point in this country than right now. You know, and I, I realistic think, realistically think if we don't right the ship where we are now in 2024, if this doesn't get corrected in the election that happens later this year, people are seriously going to be considering what a national breakup would look like. I mean, I think we could do it. Um, I think we could do it without guns, right? I think we could do it by negotiating. But I, I do think at some point the power needs to come back to the states and the states need to decide whether or not red states really want to continue to associate with blue states if our our uh, our values are that different, right? You don't really want other people spending your money. And that's exactly what's happening, right? So let's talk about the Jews, right? This is a this is a weird topic for me. I've I've never really understood the obsession with a person being Jewish. You know, I have Jewish friends, you know. You know, I'd have to really think hard about who they even are, but I know I have Jewish friends. People have told me they're Jewish and I don't really think a whole lot about it. You know, so it's kind of a head scratcher for me. You know, if 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 there's truly anti-Jewish hate in this country, it really is a mind-boggling thing for me to understand what is causing that, right? I, I just don't get it. You know, it, it's a different religion. Okay, fine. Uh, we've got lots of religions in this country. As a matter of fact, I think all of the religions uh, produce higher quality people than those folks that are in no religion at all, right? So this idea that you're just going to pick and choose one religion and you're going to point out that those people are bad, even though you don't have any supporting evidence, I think is nuts. But let's put in perspective how many Jews are really in this country, right? Only 2% of the United States population is Jewish, right? Two out of 100. And those Jews are really located in blue city centers, right? Primarily New York City, which is why... You know, people always think, you know, aren't Jews historically Democrats, right? Why are Jews historically Democrats? It's always kind of a head scratcher. Like, it seems like the liberals don't have the backs of the Jews, right? It, but Jews are liberals. So how is this supposed to sort itself out? Well, I think the explanation is less that Jews are automatic liberals and more that Jews live in these blue city centers, which makes them liberals, right? I think the, the place in which they've chosen to live uh, influences their political leanings more than the fact that they uh, you know, are from a Jewish family. So I think there's a real disconnect in our country with uh, why people are targeting Jews. And if it's even real, it, it, you know, Maybe maybe I'm way off on this. Maybe I'm totally missing something. But I think the the idea that you single out Jews and have any specific spill any specific way about them because of that is just sounds really silly to me. I've never I've never understood it. Look, that said, I I totally understand if a Jewish person is super sensitive to any type of anti-Jew hate. I mean, they have ancestors that were exterminated like animals uh, not long ago, right? They were rounded up, men, women, children, the elderly, and exterminated like animals in one of the most horrific displays of what humans are really capable of. And it wasn't that long ago. So I, I am very understanding to Jewish sensitivity, right? 
I got you. I'm with you. I don't understand why anyone would put Jews specifically in their crosshairs for their hate. And the people that are supposedly doing it, I'm not even sure they know why they're doing it. I think it's just they think their team Democrat has to be, you know, uh, the team of the underdog, right? Whoever the underdog is, we're taking them and we're arguing for them because, you know, we're losers and we're outcasts and that's what we do. We back up the underdogs and Jews aren't the underdogs. Well, I, I guess it, if you say so, I mean, I, I think it's very, very dumb, very dumb. And I, I'm not sure I, you know, as I've said all this, I'm not sure I've said anything real intelligent on this topic, except for, you know, the Jews make up such a small portion of our population and they seem to be getting an outsized amount of hate just because of their heritage and their religious beliefs, which in the United States is totally unacceptable. You know? So we'll see how this plays out. You know, best case scenario is, you know, maybe some of those Jews in those blue cities decide that they want to wake up and have, they actually have more conservative values than they want to admit, right? Maybe, Maybe their identity on Team Dem Democrat has kind of been washed away now that they've seen how they've been treated by other Team Democrat members, right? So let's leave it at that. I do want to talk about identity politics, which I think is one of the worst things that has ever been pushed on the American people. And it's really been pushed on the dumbest members of our society. And let me explain to you why. Identity politics is about separating people out based on factors outside their control, right? If your skin color is this, you're on one team with other people of that same skin color, right? If you're a woman, you're on team woman against uh, team man, right? You know, this is so stupid because, you know, I understand it's human nature to size people up to make judgments about people, you know, that's never going to stop. That's a, a function of, uh, you know, safety, right? You're trying to sort out who's good and who's bad and protect yourself from the bad people and associate with the good people, right? That's always going to be true. But only the dumbest people around us, only the dumbest people in our society would choose to sort people out based on factors outside their control, right? If I'm born white, I didn't have a choice. This is just the luck of the draw. If you're born black, you're born black. You had no choice in the matter. So to sort people out and to make judgments about people based on things they do not control is really, really stupid. Really stupid. What we need to do is we need to sort each other out based on our values, right? We need to sort each other out based on the quality of person, right? You know, for me, I don't care at all where you came from. I don't care at all what your skin color is. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I'm trying to figure out, are you a high quality person or a loser, right? Are you, are, are you someone that is self-sufficient and is going out into the world and trying to make a life for themselves and better their communities, better their families, better their churches, their businesses? Are you going out and trying to make a life for yourself or are you someone that just complains and wants to live off the government and wants the government to steal tax money from the guys out there actually doing it and redistribute it to the losers, right? That's what matters to me, right? So, you know, we have to get away from this idea that if I, all right, for example, I meet a person, right? This person's skin color is purple, right? You know, it doesn't matter what their skin color is. They're purple, for example. And I meet this person and I find out they're a liberal that all they do is complain about the situ their life situation. Uh, they aren't really doing anything to go out and make it better. They are just a whiner that wants everyone else to uh, cater to them. They want the government to be their daddy so they don't have to be married and have a family. They want to stay single their whole life and have their government be their daddy and take care of them the rest of their life. 
I am not going to like that person. I'm not going to associate myself with that person. I'm going to try to avoid that person. And I'm not, now, if I say, hey, hey, man, you and me, we don't get along. OK, we're, we're different. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any reason for us to associate. Uh, let's not be friends to stay away from each other. Well, the purple guy is going to say, oh, man, you're racist against purple people. Right. You purple people racist. You don't like me because I'm purple. And it is such a lazy argument. Dude, I don't like you because you don't have any of the values that I have. Right. I don't like you because you're a bleeding heart liberal that all they do is whine, doesn't do anything about it. I don't like you because you want a bigger government to be your daddy. When me, I want to shrink our government. I want to be self-sufficient. I want our government to steal less from its citizens. That's why I don't like you, bro. It's got nothing to do with you being purple. And I think a lot of this is happening across the country. And we're really kind of, we've really divided up because of how crazy the world has gotten. You know, prior to the last election, all of the terrible things that were done to Donald Trump to try to take him down, to discredit him. It was definitely a coordinated effort in the media, behind the scenes in the federal government. Everything they could to uh, take him out, they have done and they continue to do now using the judicial system, which is absolutely outrageous. Right. That really changed people. Right. And we are sorting ourselves out. I will tell you that I have very few liberals in my life that I have any relationship with. Right. Uh, and those people that I do, you know, primarily are family that I love above and beyond uh, their political leanings. But for the friends and acquaintances and business colleagues and all of those people, you know, if we aren't in alignment on a lot of what I think are the most important values. Right. I'm out. I'm out. And it's got nothing to do if you're a man or a woman. It's got nothing to do with whether or not you have purple skin. But the problem is that person who is the permanent victim, instead of acknowledging, oh, he doesn't like me because of my values, right? They're going to say, oh, he doesn't like me because I'm purple. He's a racist. He doesn't like me because I'm a woman. He's a misogynist, right? And we just have to stop listening to the losers who respond that way. Because I, I really think there are very, very few people in this country that are choosing not to like someone because they're purple. I, I, I think it's very unlikely that people are choosing not to like someone because they're a woman, right? Which is even dumber than the race thing. You know, women arguably are the most sought after, beautiful women rather, beautiful women are the most sought after thing on planet earth. You know, there's nothing more valuable than a beautiful woman in this on this planet. So this idea that I don't somehow don't like you, I'm a misogynist because you're a woman just makes no sense. You know, we just really need to stop listening to the nonsense, stop responding. You know, these losers are manipulating identity politics to pass through what they believe to be good governance strategies. And these good governance strategies have gotten us to over 20% inflation since 2021, right? These good governance strategies have gotten us to higher interest rates. These good governance strategies have gotten us to a, a crazy deficit with absolutely no plan in place to start to tackle it. And these bills are gonna start coming due. You can't just print money in perpetuity to cover the shortfall between your revenues and your expenses. Eventually that bill becomes due and we're getting dangerously close to that moment, right? So we have to move away from identity politics. Please, if you are a smart person and you're, you know, I would say you're uh, very smart having chosen to listen to a podcast like this, you know, when the dummies amongst us try to play the identity politics game, just don't play along, right? Don't be offended. Don't be fearful of being called a racist or a misogynist or whatever other crazy things they call people. We're going to size people up based on the quality of their character and nothing else. And if they don't like it and they want to name call you, let them not like it and let them name call you. And we got to keep moving. Okay. 
You know what? You know what else I don't like? I don't like anybody that wears a face mask. Fact. I also don't like anyone that has a pronoun on their LinkedIn profile because both of these things, right? Face masks and pronouns on LinkedIn profiles. This is virtue signaling saying, hey, I'm a liberal. I want everybody to know I'm a liberal, right? Okay. If you want, if, if, if you're going to participate in nonsense like face masks and pronouns on LinkedIn, you are a liberal and I'm out, you know, and, and that's, that's just me. You know, maybe other people are different. Maybe other people have uh, a bigger heart for liberals. But given the destruction that has happened in this country over the last four years, uh, you know, my patience has really run out. It's time to take over, time to kind of refresh the country, cleanse the country, um, you know, begin governing on a bed of uh, or a base of common sense, right? And once we kind of correct everything that's been screwed up in the last four years, we really need to tackle entitlements, right? You know, which likely means leaving Social Security alone, but Medicare and Medicaid, we need to start fine tuning what that means, right? So if, if I don't have the numbers in front of me, but a huge percentage of the money spent in Medicare is spent on the last week of that person's life, right? So we're doing everything. This person's a hundred years old. We're throwing, we're doing everything we possibly can to keep them alive for another day at huge expense. Eventually, you know, we're going to have to carve out end of life care. There's no reasonable way to think that this person is going to come back and make it for another year or two years. You know, those services are going to have to be discontinued at the taxpayer's dollar. If that person has the funds to, you know, continue to pay for their own private health care, God bless. But taxpayers cannot be paying such a huge amount of money to get these people another day or two or three or four of life. Uh, you know, that change alone would, would get us real close to balancing the budget. Right. So let's move on. Uh, last topic on politics. Did you know that the amount of money that was currently, that was recently approved for Ukraine to, uh, which eventually goes straight to the government uh, contractors here in the country, and then they take the money and they send the weapons to Ukraine. That's how it works, right? Ukraine is going to get some cash, but most of the cash goes, uh, generally goes to uh, American contractors who build weapons, right? So there's some conflicts of interest there immediately, but the amount of money that was recently earmarked for Ukraine to fight in a war that they absolutely cannot win is greater than the entire annual budget of the Marine Corps, right? We could have doubled the Marine Corps budget and put us in a much uh, stronger position as a country. And instead we've taken money that we had to go out into the world and borrow or go out into the world and print increasing the inflation problem that we have in this country. And then we send it to other countries to fight in wars they cannot win. That does not make any financial sense. No one would do that if this was, if, if we were operating the federal government as if it were a business that needed to break even or turn a profit every year or it goes out of business, no one in their right mind would be going out into the market to borrow money that we don't have and send it to Ukraine to fight in a war that they cannot win. That would never happen. Only the buffoons in our federal government would ever consider doing such a thing. All right. That's probably enough for everybody. I know we can only take so much politics in one sitting. Let's talk about interest rates, right? At the beginning of the year, the Fed projected six interest rate cuts in 2024. The problem with that is inflation is not getting better. It's trending in the wrong direction. And we can talk about why that is, but let's stay focused on this. We are now, as of May, we are now expecting at best one rate cut at the end of the year. Uh, at worst, maybe one interest rate increase at the end of the year. You know, this is the hole 
that the federal government has dug for us. You know, the problem with inflation is a problem of government spending. The, the reason that our elected leaders, who I did not elect, but certainly some of you out there listening voted to elect, they, the Democrat Party, does not have an agenda if they cannot spend more money, right? Their only agenda is spend more money, spend, mo- spend, 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 spend. There's not been one single thing that they have done since in power that didn't involve spending more money than we do not have. So once we got into, you know, 21, 22, we saw inflation on the horizon, right? We saw it coming. It was obvious, right? This is when they were saying that uh, inflation is, is just a passing fad, right? It's not it's not going to stay with us. It's transitory, as they say. It's going to pass. They had to say that. Otherwise, there would not have been the appetite to spend money we don't have into an inflationary environment. So they lied to the American people saying, hey, the inflation we're experiencing today is transitory. Don't worry about it. We need to keep spending. Spend, 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 spend into an inflationary environment. And this is what you get, right? They just could not help themselves because if they did not implement their agenda, they would have nothing to run on in 2024. So they said, you know what? Inflation be damned. What's most important is that we remain in power. And in our foolish assessment, for us to remain in power, we have to have an agenda to run on in 2024. In order to have an agenda to run on 24. We've got to keep spending money because that's all we do. Spend more money, spend more money, spend more money. So they continue to spend in a desire to stay in power, which continued to make inflation worse, which is why we're up over 20% in inflation since 2021. It's, it's worse in places like the grocery store where people are getting hit hardest, right? Not even to take into consideration what they've done to interest rates that have now made Car loans unaffordable, home loans unaffordable, credit card bills have gone up. All of the damage that was caused was caused knowing it was a likely outcome, but choosing to to execute an agenda they thought would retain power in 2024. All we had to do to tamp down inflation was to pull back on government spending. Right. But they absolutely refuse to do that. Right. So what they say is, all right, we've got to spend more on the government. So now we need consumers to spend less. We need to make up for what we're overspending on the government side by having the private sector spend less. We need to increase interest rates. People will spend less money if it costs more to borrow and buy things. So they wanted the correction to come from the private sector, even though the cause of the inflation is coming from the federal government. Really, really stupid. And no one would do it if the federal government was run like a business. Right. All right. Let's keep moving. Bosa Properties of Canada, a large developer and investor, They analyzed 100 markets in North America and whittled that 100 markets down to the three most attractive markets, right? Those three most attractive markets became Nashville, Austin, and Atlanta. They then chose Nashville for a very, very impressive triple tower development at 14th and Church, the first tower soon to come out of the ground with 325 apartment units. So what I want to take away from this quick story is you've got sophisticated owner, developer, investors, even from outside the country, looking at the United States, trying to decide where we park our money for safety and for returns, right? And they've chosen Nashville as one of the three markets where those returns are most possible. That's what we have going for us in Nashville. Let's keep moving. Short-term rentals. 
big business in Nashville. I've done a, a lot of short term rental deals, you know, uh, Nashville land zone for short term rentals are is likely the most in demand type of land that's available outside of perhaps industrial zone land because short term rentals in Nashville are big business, right? So what I've got for you here is a list of the top five markets based on where you can make the most money on short term rentals defined as estimated yearly return on investment per property. Number one on the list, Henderson, Nevada. You can expect to make about $32,000 per property. Number two, Nashville, Tennessee, $27,000 per property. So the average short-term rental in Nashville nets the owner about a $27,000 return on investment per year, right? Three, North Las Vegas, four, Las Vegas, and five, Boston. So three out of the top five short-term rental markets are Las Vegas and Las Vegas suburbs. And you've got Nashville and somehow Boston made their way onto the list. So again, Nashville has been very insulated from a lot of the pain being felt in other areas of the country. Still number two in the country for the short-term rental business. Let's keep moving here. Highwoods is a national REIT that specializes in office, right? So we've been talking about office today. They've narrowed their markets down to four, right? Highwoods has really been killing it. They, they own a lot of the property that you see in Williamson County, for example, they focus on class A suburban office space and they've narrowed their four markets down to Nashville, Orlando, Atlanta, and Raleigh. Highwoods has a 90% plus occupancy rate, which is half of the national vacancy rate. And they have, they had 698,000 square feet come online just in the fourth quarter. So they've got all of this new space coming online still less about 10% vacancy. So what I take away from this beyond Nashville being in the top four markets nationally, which is the a theme of today's show, they've really gone all in on class A suburban office space, which was a very smart bet. You know, if it were me, I, I have a, an office built near my home um, because I very much hate commuting. I hate wasting time. I like to be efficient and I like to be around my family. We homeschool our children. So I like to be around my family and try to be the best father I can be. So I'm not trying to go into a city center either. And I think there's a lot of people that feel the same. If they could simply leave their house and drive to a nearby class A office space in the suburbs, I think that's an option they would take. And I think that it was a smart investment thesis for Highwoods and they are really benefiting from that now. All right, as we wrap things up, let's talk about the celebrity branded bars downtown and Broadway. The average tourist comes to Nashville and sees Luke's 32 Bridge food and drink, for example, and they think Luke Bryan owns it. It's not true, right? That bar is owned by a, a company called TC Restaurant Group, right? And what they do is they sign licensing deals with the Luke Bryans of the world. And they say, hey, let us put your name on our celebrity branded bar and you'll be paid a portion of the revenue that we generate, right? And I used to know what the average uh, license percentage was and I can't recall, so I'm, I'm not gonna guess. But I, I did the math one time and the amount of money these people make by put, allowing their name to be put on these bars is really astronomical. It's in the millions per year, just put their name on a bar that they don't even own. So recently, the FGL house for Florida Georgia Line, which was a rough name to start with, you know, FGL house. We could have done better with that, in my opinion. So Florida Georgia Line, they broke up. They actually had a problem with one being a liberal, one being a conservative. Right. These two guys in the conservative 
cut the liberal loose and did so in a very kind of unexpected, shocking way, I'm told. The liberal didn't see it coming. And then the guy that the, the conservatives names Brian Kelly, as a matter of fact, he moves down to the 30A area in Florida, which is where a lot of the folks in our area vacation. And he actually put out his own uh, his own solo album recently, and it's all beach country music. So I encourage you to check it out. I don't recall the the name of the album itself right now, but very interesting. I, I love the idea of beach music fused with country music. You know, you've seen Kenny Chesney do it uh, to great success. You've seen uh, the Zach Brown uh, back in the day. He did it really well, some of his best albums. So Brian Kelly has a beach country album now that he's separated off from Florida Georgia line worth taking a look at. But the FGL house has been recent is being rebranded to Laney Wilson's bar. And I don't think they have a, a name that they've said yet, but FGL house is going to become a, a Laney Wilson celebrity branded bar. The same group owns that property as uh, Luke's 32 bridge food and drink. This is TC restaurant group. They also own Jason Aldean's kitchen and rooftop bar, Miranda Lambert's Casa Rosa. And this bar in Tennessee kitchen, which is a six story new complex that's associated with Morgan Wallen. These are all licensed deals. These are all very lucrative deals for everyone involved. And it benefits them uh, to have the tourists that come to town that is really who's packing the Broadway bars to think that they're actually owned by Miranda and Luke and Jason and Morgan. And they, they show up at these bars thinking that they're going to sit down next to them at some point, right? That's not what's happening. You know. It's a, it's a business transaction. That's very, very lucrative for everyone involved. Lastly, I'm going to give you a real quick update on where we are in the NBA playoffs, because I know a lot of you haven't really tuned in yet. We're down to the elite eight, right? The T wolves from Minnesota, the lowly T wolves are playing the reigning champion nuggets, right? And you would think the nuggets are probably the favorites behind the Boston Celtics, right? Oh no. The T wolves are up two zero over the nuggets at this point. The last game they won by 26 points, both games in Denver, the, the, the lowly Minnesota Timberwolves went to Denver and won the first two games. The Cavs are playing the Celtics. That's going to be a very difficult matchup for the Cavs. Celtics uh, have been the best team in the league. They just lost their center, though, and I haven't up, heard an update on how long he's out, so that could throw them off. The Mavs are playing the Thunder. The Thunder were the number one team in their division, the lowly Oklahoma Thunder somehow made it to number one in their division. They're playing the Mavs with Luka and Kyrie. The Indiana Pacers are playing the New York Knickerbockers. The Knicks are up 1-0 on, on that series, the last I check. So I would tell you, more than uh, any time in the last 10 years, the NBA championship is absolutely wide open and for the taking. And wouldn't it be something to see the Timberwolves, the, the Minnesota Timberwolves, who have a stud uh, with Anthony Edwards, you know, but beyond that, they, they were a bunch of dogs. You know, my background is basketball. I play basketball. My son plays basketball. I coach basketball. So I'm, I'm, I'm a big basketball guy. And uh, to see the T-Wolves play defense, they play defense like no other team in the NBA is playing defense. They are a bunch of dogs up and down the court. They make you fight for every dribble. So if you haven't tuned in yet to see the Minnesota Timberwolves, I would uh, sincere, sincerely tell you to check them out. They are very, very fun to watch. And Anthony Edwards on offense and defense is very Michael Jordan-like. And if you're my age, I came up with Mike Jordan. He's my goat. Well, you've got what seems to be a carbon copy of Michael Jordan and Anthony Edwards for the Minnesota Timberwolves. So I think... If you are not a big NBA guy, I get it. They got kind of woke over the years. I think it's worth starting to tune back in right about now. May and June, they're going to sort out who the best team in the NBA is. And I'm rooting for the Minnesota Timberwolves, believe it or not. They are a very, very fun team to watch. So that's what I've got for you all today, guys. I appreciate everyone tuning in. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, improve the podcast. We're going to continue to bring you 
local information, uh, along with kind of fun, unfiltered discussions about the political situation in this country. Um, so thanks so much. Until next week, we'll talk to you then.